It has been said that if you wish to see far ahead in time, you must first look far back to find lessons from the past. The archiving of documents from the past and the present is an important source for architecture and design. It captures the passing of time. It is a testament to the evolution of the discipline. The following masterclasses record the individual processes of professionals and their ways of working. Hello, my name is Michelle Elagat and I am Chief of Archives, Library and Research Collections at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, New York. I'm pleased to be with you here today to tell you a little bit about the MoMA Archive Program. The archives at MoMA were officially founded in 1989. And if you know the history of the Museum of Modern Art, you might be surprised because you may know that the museum itself was created in 1929. So you see that there is a big lag um, in time between the founding of the institution and the creation of a formal archival program, which is frankly not unusual in the United States. Um, there was really a big push to create formalized archival programs in museums in the 1980s. Um, so as a, you know, a younger nation and, and, and younger museums, um, sometimes archives were not in the forefront of museums thinking. But we're very pleased that we did a lot of catch up since 1989. And in the subs subsequent decades, uh, the MoMA Archives program has grown um, quite a bit. Uh, we were able to retrieve historical documents that had been retained in the institution, but they simply had not been organized, preserved, and made accessible according to proper and internationally accepted archival guidelines and principles. So what I can tell you is today, we count our holdings at being some 6.5 million items in the MoMA archives. And these include not just traditional, you know, paper-based materials like letters and internal memoranda, but also things like photographs, sound and video recordings, notebooks, textiles, um, diaries, oral histories, etc. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about those holdings uh, momentarily. We um, quantify archival holdings, I mean, at least in the United States, by linear feet. And so we estimate we have more than 6,000 linear feet of materials. We also have something like over 300,000 photographs and 7,000 um, audio and video recordings. So let me tell you a little bit about our holdings and how they're organized. So for, to begin with, uh, when the museum's archives was created, it was created as the institutional repository for the museum's own documentation, right? So the records that we created throughout the course of our history during doing the normal course of business. So those records can include things like programmatic records, records from the press office, the Department of Communications, records from the Education Department, you know, uh, records on family programs, tours, art making classes. Records from the registrar documenting the, the intake and outgoing uh, loans of artworks. Records from our curators uh, regarding all of their exhibitions that have been created over the many decades here. Um, and so on and so forth. We also have records that include uh, bodies of material from specific individuals. So we call those personal papers. Uh, they're personal professional papers, but organized by the creator. So for example, we have the papers of the founding director of MoMA, Alfred Barr, or the second director, Renee Darnancourt, or other wonderful curators such as Dorothy Miller. Of course, one of the highlights that I really like about um, these wonderful records is in so many cases, our staff corresponded directly with artists and architects and designers. And we have really fascinating and beautiful uh, artist letters, uh, many of which are fanciful and wonderfully decorated in our holdings. Makes it a little more fun than just maybe some government archive. <laughs> 
We also, as I mentioned, have um, a terrific photographic archive documenting many aspects of the museum's history, um, events, exhibitions, uh, performances, visits by royalty or you know, famous individuals, um, also photographs of our staff, trustees, and artists. Our holdings also include, as I mentioned, um, thousands of audio and video recordings. Um, and our earliest dating from 1939, uh, that, that actually came to us on a, a vinyl disc. Um, today, of course, all of these types of materials are captured and transferred to us digitally. We also run an oral history program where we've uh, interviewed over 100 individuals with his historical links to the institution, whether that be um, former staff or trustees, um, but also we've done a wonderful project to interview artists who are well represented in our collection. And you may know that within the last decade or so, MoMA merged with PS1 Contemporary Art Center. And I'm very proud to say that we were able to transfer all of their archives into our holdings and really found and established the MoMA PS1 archives. But basically, our principles for how we approach all these materials um, is the same, whether they're internal records or external records. And that is that we treat each um, unit or body of materials as a separate collection. And this follows archival, internationally accepted archival principles uh, relating to provenance, meaning that you keep the records created by a particular individual or unit separate and cohesively together as its own unit, body of material. Um, you don't mix it with another collection. So even if I have um, a curator research files on uh, Picasso in general, and then some exhibition documentation about a very specific Picasso exhibition that was held here, I don't intermix them. I keep them in their two separate um, units or collections. And then the second main um, archival principle is original order, that you keep the materials in the order that the creator kept them, because it tells you not just the information within the documents, but it tells you actually what the creator was thinking or how they were approaching organizing that information, which is very important indeed. So within each collection um, in archival um, work, we basically think often about collections on collective levels. As I mentioned, we have 6.5 million items, I think. I haven't counted them all. Um, but certainly, it would be very uh, difficult to uh, inventory or catalog every single item. So therefore, we break collections down into um, series and potentially sub-series. So a collection could have, um, you know, a series relating to uh, correspondence or diaries or letters. No matter, it doesn't matter. It's however the originator um, collected and organized their materials. Um, so we look at series and then sub-series. And then for traditional paper-based materials, we then look at the file folder level. And it's really at this level in MoMA archives where we concentrate our efforts to inventory our collections. We describe at the file level. So one folder might have more than 100 items in it. But if it's all correspondence, um, related to a single individual, we will just make a file level description that says includes correspondence with Mr. XYZ. Um, and we always give the date range of the materials um, as long as it's evident. And so our inventories, which in the United States are called finding aids, um, our inventories include the folder number, the description of the file, and the date. 
And basically, this is the information that we publish out on our website. Um, and this is how researchers can discover what our holdings include. And then they can just use the simple collection name and folder number to request the materials. So all of that is for traditional research, um, which we in normal times uh, can accommodate um, on site here. We're at the moment closed to the public, but looking forward to the day we can reopen. So that's for traditional research, but I, I'd also like to say what we're very proud of here is that I think we've um, excelled at taking MoMA archives and pushing it beyond the boundaries of just traditional research. We've been very active in hosting classes, programs, and artists' open houses, which have been very, very um, popular here. Um, and we've also done some other projects where we're really trying to promote out to the world um, information about our materials. And so I'd like to tell you about a few of those. Um, for example, several years ago, we launched an online MoMA exhibition history project. You can find it at moma.org slash history. And in this case, um, it's an online project. Some people would call it an archive, right? But what we did here was combine information from multiple different collections. So in pure archival science, you'd actually refer to this as more of an um, artificial collection. But it doesn't really matter in this case because this is virtual anyways, and we're talking about digital surrogates. But what's so great about this project is we've um, provided a history of all of MoMA's exhibitions from 1929 to today. Each exhibition has its own web page. And when you go, you can search for it. And when you land on the web page, you will find um, for every exhibition when it's extant, the catalog, the press release, the checklist, an index of all the artists participating, and installation photographs, some of which um, even have uh, artworks uh, tagged within. So we're very pleased um, in that way to be able to share our exhibition records, which we have a straightforward inventory and they're just sort of the paper records are in one collection, the installation photos are in another collection, um, the press releases are in another collection, but in the digital sphere, we're able to merge them and deliver them out. In a similar way, we have an image database um, for our holdings. And again, it does not include all of our holdings, but we've digitized some 50,000 selected items. And in our image database, which you can find find at maid.moma.org. In this instance, we've actually individually cataloged the items because that's the only way to have you know, a digital image well easily retrievable. And you can search by keyword and pull up um, just wonderful images. We also find that the archives are increasingly used um, in MoMA's exhibition program, which we're particularly proud of. Um, and again, I think it's because of these efforts to um, inventory, describe, and make accessible our holdings, both in traditional ways as well as more using digital tools to make them more discoverable. And one project that we're thrilled about is we were part of an exhibition at the Fondation Louis Vuitton where the archives was actually given 3,000 um, square feet to present the history of the institution as told through its archives. The following year in 2019, MoMA reopened the, the new MoMA um, and had installed our collection galleries in a new novel way where combining mediums and also including archives in the presentation. And we're thrilled to have a gallery devoted to Frank O'Hara currently on view. Uh, I guess in closing, lastly, I'd like to also explain um, how the archives can be disseminated, not just digitally and through the galleries, but also through a publication program. Um, we find the archives increasingly used in MoMA publications and in books uh, published by others, including 
um, a recent book titled Mo Modern Artifacts that has come out by Esopus Books. And it's wonderful because this basically takes um, an, a, a series of articles that were published in Esopus magazine over a 12 year period and compiles them into a single uh, volume. And it's a really lovely way to see the archives come to life and be activated. And if there's one thing um, that always motivates me is a passion for archives, um, the, the excitement of art history, and the way to engage with the past that archives allow.